The Civil War in France by Karl Marx, Chapter 6, The Fall of Paris. The first attempt of the slaveholders' conspiracy to put down Paris by getting the Prussians to occupy it was frustrated by Bismarck's refusal. The second attempt, that of March 18th, ended in the rout of the army and the flight to Versailles of the government, which ordered the whole administration to break up and follow in its track. By the semblance of peace negotiations with Paris, Thiers found the time to prepare for war against it. But where to find an army? The remnants of the line regiments were weak in number and unsafe in character. His urgent appeal to the provinces to succor Versailles by their National Guards and volunteers met with a flat refusal. Brittany alone furnished a handful of Chewins fighting under a white flag, every one of them wearing on his breast the heart of Jesus in white cloth and shouting, Vive le, le Roi! Long live the King! Thiers was therefore compelled to collect in hot haste a motley crew composed of sailors, marines, pontifical zouaves, valentines, gendarmes, and Pietri's sergent de ville and mouchard. This army, however, would have been ridiculously ineffective without the installments of imperialist war prisoners, which Bismarck granted in numbers just sufficient to keep the civil war going and keep the Versailles government in abject dependence on Prussia. During the war itself, the Versailles police had to look after the Versailles army, while the gendarmes had to drag it on by exposing themselves at all posts of danger. The forts which fell were not taken, but bought. The heroism of the Federals convinced Thiers that the, resi the resistance of Paris was not to be broken by his own strategic genius and the bayonets at his disposal. Meanwhile, his relations with the provinces became more and more difficult. Not one single address of approval came in to gladden Thiers and his rurals. Quite the contrary. Deputations and addresses demanding, in a tone anything but respectful, conciliation with Paris on the basis of the unequivocal recognition of the Republic, the acknowledgement of the communal liberties, and the dissolution of the National Assembly, whose mandate was extinct, poured in from all sides, and in such numbers that Dufour, Thiers's Minister of Justice, in his circular of April 23rd to the public prosecutors, commanded them to treat the cry of conciliation as a crime. In regard, however, of the hopeless prospect held out by his campaign, Thiers resolved to shift his tactics by ordering, all over the country, municipal elections to take place on April 30th, on the basis of the new municipal law dictated by himself to the National Assembly. What with the intrigues of his prefects, what with police intimidation, he felt quite sanguine of imparting, by the verdict of the provinces, to the National Assembly that moral power it had never possessed, and of getting at last from the provinces the physical force required for the conquest of Paris. His bandit warfare against Paris exalted in his own bulletins and the attempts of his ministers at the estab establishment throughout France of a foreign or of a reign of terror. Thiers was from the beginning anxious to accompany with a little byplay of conciliation, which had to serve more than one purpose. It was to dupe the provinces, to inveigle the middle class elements in Paris, and above all, to afford the professed Republicans in the National Assembly the opportunity of hiding their treason against Paris behind their faith in Thiers. On March 21st, when still without an army, he had declared to the Assembly, come that May, I will not send an army to Paris. On March 27th, he rose again. I have found the Republic an accomplished fact, and I am firmly resolved to maintain it. In reality, he put down the revolution at Lyon and Marseille in the name of the Republic, while the roars of his rurals drowned the very mention of his name at Versailles. After this exploit, he toned down the accomplished fact into a hypothetical fact. The Orleans princes, whom he had cautiously warned off Bordeaux, were now in flagrant breach of the law, 
permitted to intrigue at Dre or Drux. Dr I don't know. Dre. The concessions held out by Thierse in his interminable interviews with the delegates from Paris and the provinces, although constantly varied in tone and color, according to time and circumstances, did in fact never come to more than the prospective restriction of revenge to the handful of criminals implicated in the murder of Le Comte and Clement Thomas, on the well understood premise that Paris and France were unreservedly to accept M. Thiers himself as the best of possible republics, as he in 1830 had done with Louis Philippe and in 1849 under Louis Bonaparte's presidency. While out of office, he made a fortune by pleading for the Paris capitalists and made political capital by pleading against the laws he had himself originated. He now hurried through the National Assembly not only a set of repressive laws which were, after the fall of Paris, to, to extirpate the last remnants of Republican liberty in France. He foreshadowed the fate of Paris by abridging what was for him the too slow procedure of courts martial, and by a newfangled draconic code of deportation. The revolution of 1848, abolishing the penalty of death for political crimes, had replaced it by deportation. Louis Bonaparte did not dare, at least not in theory, to re-establish the regime of the guillotine. The rural assembly, not yet bold enough even to hint that the Parisians were not rebels, but assassins, had therefore to confine its prospective vengeance against Paris to Dufour's new code of deportation. Under all these circumstances, Thiers himself could not have gone on with his comedy of conciliation, had it not, as he intended it to do, drawn forth shrieks of rage from the rurals, whose ruminating mind did neither understand the play nor its necessities of, hypo of hypocrisy, tergiversation, and procrastination. In sight of the impending municipal elections of April 30th, Thiers enacted one of his great conciliation scenes on April 27th. Amidst a flood of sentiment rhetoric, he explained from the tribune of the assembly, there exists no conspiracy against the Republic, but that of Paris, which compels us to shed French blood. I repeat it again and again, let those impious arms fall from the hands which hold them and chastisement will be arrested at once by an act of peace, excluding only the small number of criminals. To the violent interruption of the rules, he replied, Gentlemen, tell me, I implore you, am I wrong? Do you really regret that I could have stated the truth, that the criminals are only a handful? Is it not fortunate in the midst of our misfortunes that those who have been capable to shed the blood of Clement Thomas and General Lecomte are but rare exceptions. France, however, turned a deaf ear to what Thiers flattered himself to be a parliamentary siren song. Out of 700,000 municipal councillors returned by the 35,000 communes still left to France, the United Legitimists, Orleanists, and Bonapartists did not carry 8,000. The supplementary elections which followed were still more decidedly hostile. Thus, instead of getting from the provinces the badly needed physical force, the National Assembly lost even its last claim to moral force, that of being the expression of the universal suffrage of the country. To complete the discom discomfit discomfiture, the newly chosen municipal councils of all the cities of France openly threatened the usurping assembly at Versailles with a counter-assembly at Bordeaux. Then the long expected moment of decisive action had at last come for Bismarck. He peremptorily summoned Thiers to send to Frankfurt plenipotentiaries for the definitive settlement of peace. In humble obedience to the call of his master, Thiers hastened to dispatch, dispatch his trusty Jules Favre, backed by Pouillet Courtier. Pouillet Courtier, an eminent ruin cotton spinner, a fervent and even servile partisan of the Second Empire, had never found any fault with it save its commercial treaty with England, prejudicial to his own shop interest. 
hardly installed at Bordeaux as Thiers's Minister of Finance, he denounced that unholy treaty hinted at its near abrogation and, and had even the effrontery to try, although in vain, having counted without Bismarck, the immediate enforcement of the old protective duties against Alsace, where he, where he said no previous international treaties stood in the way. This man who considered counter-revolution as a means to put down wages at ruin and the surrender of French provinces as a means to bring up the price of his wares in France, was he not the one predestined to be picked out by Thiers as the helpmate of Jules Favre in his last and crowning treason? On the arrival at Frankfurt of this exquisite pair of plenipotentiaries, Bully Bismarck at once met them with the imperious alternative, either the restoration of the empire or the unconditional acceptance of my own peace terms. These terms included a shortening of the intervals in which war indemnity was to be paid and the continued occupation of the Ferris forts by Prussian troops until Bismarck should feel satisfied with the state of things in France. Prussia thus being recognized as the supreme arbiter in internal French politics. In return for this, he offered to let loose for the extermination of Paris, the Bonapartist army, and to lend them the direct assistance of Emperor William's troops. He pledged his good faith by making payment of the first installment of the indemnity dependent on the pacification of Paris. Such bait was, of course, eagerly swallowed by Thiers and his plenipotentiaries. They signed the Treaty of Peace on May 10th and had it endorsed by the Versailles Assembly on the 18th. In the interval between the conclusion of peace and the arrival of the Bonapartist prisoners, Thiers felt the more bound to resume, to resume his comedy of conciliation, as his Republican tools stood in sore need of a pretext for blinking their eyes at the preparations for the carnage of Paris. As late as May 18th, he replied to a deputation of middle-class conciliators. Whenever the insurgents will make up their minds for capitulation, the gates of Paris shall be flung wide open during a week for all, except the murderers of Generals Clement Thomas and Leconte. A few days afterwards, when violently interpolated on those promises by the rurals, he refused to enter into any explanations not, however, without giving them this significant hint. I tell you there, there are impatient men amongst you, men who are in too great a hurry. They must have another eight days. At the end of these eight days, there will be no more danger, and the task will be proportionate to their courage and to their capacities. As soon as McMahon was able to assure him that he could shortly enter Paris, Thiers declared to the assembly that he would enter Paris with the laws in his hands, and demand a full expiation from the wretches who had sacrificed the lives of soldiers and destroyed public monuments. As the moment of decision drew near, he said to the assembly, I shall be pitiless, to Paris that it was doomed, and to his Bonapartist bandits that they had, they, that they had state license to wreak vengeance upon Paris to their heart's content. At last, when treachery had opened the gates of Paris to General Douay on May 21st, Thiers on the 22nd revealed to the rurals the goal of his conciliation comedy, which they had so obstinately persisted in not understanding. I told you a few day days ago that we are approaching our goal. Today I come to tell you the goal is reached. The victory of order, justice, and civilization is at last won. So it was. The civilization and justice of bourgeois order comes out in its lurid light whenever the slaves and drudges of that order rise against their masters. Then this civilization and justice stand forth as undisguised savagery and lawless revenge. Each new crisis in the class struggle between the appropriator and the, product and the producer brings out this fact more glaringly. Even the atrocities of the bourgeois in June 1848 vanish before the infamy of 1871. The self-sacrificing heroism with which the population of Paris men, women, and children fought for eight days after the entrance of the Versa Versailles reflects as much the grandeur of their cause as the infernal deeds of the soldiery reflect the innate spirit of that civilization, 
indeed the great problem of which is how to get rid of the heaps of corpses it made after the battle was over. To find a parallel for the conduct of Thiers and his bloodhounds, we must go back to the times of Sulla and the two triumvirates of Rome. The same wholesale slaughter in cold blood, the same disregard in massacre of age and sex, the same system of torturing prisoners, the same prescriptions, but this time of a whole class, the same savage hunt after concealed leaders lest one might escape, the denunciations of political and private enemies, the same indifference for the butchery of entire strangers to the feud. There is but this difference, that the Romans had no mitrailleurs for the dispatch in the lump of the prescribed, and that they had not the law in their hands, nor on their lips, the cry of civilization. And after those horrors, look upon the other still more hideous face of the bourgeois civilization as described by its own press. With stray shots, writes the Paris correspondent of a London Tory paper, still ringing in the distance, and unintended wounded wretches dying amid the tombstones of Père, Père Lachaise, with 6,000 6, terror-stricken insurgents wandering in an agony of despair in the labyrinth of the catacombs, and wretches hurried through the streets to be shot down in scores by the mitrailleuses. It is revolting to see the cafes filled with the votaries of absinthe, billiards, and dominoes. Female profligacy perambulating the boulevards and the sound of revelry disturbing the night from the cabinets particulier of fashionable restaurants. M. Edouard Herve writes in the Journal de Paris, a, Versa a Versaillist journal pressed by the Commune, the way in which the population of Paris manifested its satisfaction yesterday was rather more than frivolous, and we fear it will grow worse as time progresses. Paris has now a fete day appearance, which is sadly out of place, and unless we are to be called the Parisienne de la Décadence, this sort of thing must come to an end. And then he quotes the passage from Tacitus. Yet on the morrow of that horrible struggle, even before it was completely over, Rome, degraded and corrupt, began once more to wallow in the voluptuous slough which was destroying its body and pulling its soul. Alibi pro prolia et vulnera, alibi balnea poponique. Here fights and wounds, there baths and restaurants. M. Herve only forgets to say that the population of Paris he speaks of is but the population of the Paris of M. Thiers. The Franc Fleur, or the Franc Fleur, returning in throngs from Versailles, Saint Denis, Roy, and Saint Germain, the Paris of the decline. In all its bloody triumphs over the self sacrificing champions of a new and better society, that nefarious civilization based upon the enslavement of labor drowns the moans of its victims in a hue and cry of calumny, reverberated by a worldwide echo. The serene working men's Paris of the Commune is suddenly changed into a pandemonium by the bloodhounds of order. And what does this tremendous change prove to the bourgeois mind of all countries? Why, that the Commune has conspired against civilization. The Paris people die enthusiastically for the Commune in numbers unequally in any battle known to history. What does that prove? Why, that the Commune was not the people's own government, but the usurpation of a handful of criminals? The women of Paris joyfully give up their lives at the barricades and on the place of execution. What does this prove? Why, that the demon of the Commune has changed them into Megera and, Heca and Hecates. The moderation of the commune during the two months of undisputed sway is equally only is equaled only by the heroism of its defense. What does that prove? Why, that for months the commune carefully hid under a mask of moderation and humanity the bloodthirstiness of its fiendish instincts to be let loose in the hour of its agony. The workingmen's Paris in the act of its heroic self-Holocaust, involved in its flames, buildings, and monuments. While tearing to pieces the living body of the proletariat, its rulers must no longer expect to return triumphantly into the intact architecture of their abodes. The government of Versailles cries, incendiarism, 
and whispers this cue to all its agents, down to the remotest hamlet to hunt up its enemies everywhere, a suspect of professional incendiarism. The bourgeoisie of the whole world, which looks complacently upon the wholesale massacre after the battle, is convulsed by horror at the desecration of brick and mortar. When governments give state licenses to their navies to kill, burn, and destroy, is that license for incendiarism? When the British troops wantonly set fire to the capital at Washington and to the summer palace of the Chinese emperor, was that incendiarism? When the Prussians, not for military reasons, but out of the mere spite of revenge, burned down by the help of petroleum, towns like Shadodan and in innumerable villages, was that incendiarism? When Thierse, during six weeks, bombarded Paris under the pretext that he wanted to set fire to those houses only in which were, there were people, was that incendiarism? In war, fire is an arm as legitimate as any. Buildings held by the enemy are shelled to set them on fire. If their defenders have, no re have to retire, they themselves light the flames to prevent the attack from making use of the buildings. To be burned down has always been the inevitable fate of all buildings situated in the front of battle of all the regular armies of the world. But in the war of the enslaved against their enslavers, the only justifiable war in history, this is by no means to hold good. The commune used fire strictly as a means of defense. They used it to stop up the Versailles troops, those long straight avenues which Haussmann had expressly opened to artillery fire. They used it to cover their retreat in the same way as the Versailles in their advance, used, used their shells which destroyed at least as many buildings as the fire of the commune. It is a matter of dispute even now which buildings were set, were set fire to, to by the defense and which by the attack. And the defense resorted to fire only when the Versailles troops had already commenced their wholesale murdering of prisoners. Besides, the commune had, long before, given full public notice that if driven to extremities, they would bury themselves under the ruins of Paris and make Paris a second Moscow, as the government of national defense, but only as a cloak for its treason, had promised to do. For this purpose, Trocu had found them the petroleum, the commune knew that its opponents cared nothing for the lives of the Paris people, but cared much for their own Paris buildings. And Thierse, on the other hand, had given them notice that he would be implacable in his vengeance. No sooner had he got his army ready on one side and the Prussians shutting the trap on the other, than he proclaimed, I shall be pitiless, the expiation will be complete and justice will be stern. If the acts of the Paris working men were vandalism, it was the vandalism of defense in despair, not the vandalism of triumph, like that which the Christians perpetrated upon the really priceless art treasures of heathen antiquity. And even that vandalism has been justified by the historian as an unavoidable and comparatively trifling non combatant to the titanic struggle between a new society arising and an old one breaking down. It was still less the vandalism of Haussmann, raising historic Paris to make place for the Paris of the sightseer. But the execution by the commune of the 64 hostages with the Archbishop of Paris at their head, the bourgeoisie and its army in June 1848 reestablished a custom which had long disappeared from the practice of war, the shooting of their defenseless prisoners. This brutal custom has since been more or less strictly adhered to by the suppressors of all popular commotions in Europe and India, thus proving that it, co it constitutes a real progress of civilization. On the other hand, the Prussians in, pa in France had reestablished the practice of taking hostages, innocent men who, with their lives, were to answer to them for the acts of others. When fierce, as we have seen from the very beginning of the conflict, enforced the human practice of shooting down the communal prisoners, the commune, to protect their lives, was obliged to resort to the Prussian practice of securing hostages. The lives of the hostages have been forfeited over and over again by the continued shooting of prisoners on the part of the Versailles. How could they be spared any longer after the carnage with which the McMahon's Praetorians celebrated their entrance into Paris? 
was even the last check upon the unscrupulous ferocity of bourgeois governments, the taking of hostages to be made a mere sham of? The real murderer of Archbishop Darboy is Thierse. The commune again and again had offered to exchange the archbishop and ever so many priests in the bargain against the single blankie, then in the hands of Thierse. Thierse obstinately refused. He knew that with Blanky he would give the commune a head, while the archbishop would serve his purpose best in the shape of a corpse. Thierse acted upon the precedent of Savignac. How, in June 1848, did not Savignac and his men of order raise shouts of horror by stigmatizing the insurgents as the assassins of Archbishop Affray? They knew perfectly well that the archbishop had been shot by the soldiers of order. M. Jacquemin, the archbishop's vicar general, present on the spot, had immediately afterwards handed them in his evidence to that effect. All the course of calumny, which the party of order never fail, in their orgies of blood to raise against their victims, only proves that the bourgeois of our days considers themselves the legitimate successor to the baron of old, who thought every weapon in his own hand fair against the plebeian while in the hands of the plebeian, plebeian, a weapon of any kind constituted in itself a crime. The conspiracy of the ruling class to break down the revolution by a civil war carried on under the patronage of the foreign invader, a conspiracy which we have traced from the very 4th of September down to the entrance of McMahon's uh, Praetorians through the gate of St. Cloud, culminated in the carnage of Paris. Bismarck gloats over the ruins of Paris, in which he saw perhaps the first installment of that general destruction of great cities he had prayed for when still a simple rural in the Prussian Chambre Introuvable of 1849. He gloats over the cadavers of the Paris proletariat. For him, this is not only the extermination of revolution, but the extinction of France, now decapitated in reality and by the French government itself. With the shallowness characteristic of all successful statesmen, he sees but the surface of this tremendous historic event. Whenever before his history exhibited the spectacle of a conqueror crowning his victory by turning into not only the gendarme, but the hired bravo of the conquered government, there existed no war between Prussia and the Commune of Paris. On the contrary, the Commune had accepted the peace preliminaries and Prussia had announced her neutrality. Prussia was therefore no belligerent. She acted the part of a bravo, a cowardly bravo, because incurring no danger. A hired bravo, because stipulating beforehand the payment of her blood money of 500 millions on the fall of Paris. And thus at last came out the true character of the war ordained by Providence as a chastisement of godless and debauched France by pious and moral Germany. And this unparalleled breach of the laws of nation, of nations, even as understood by the old world lawyers, instead of arousing the civilized governments of Europe to declare the felonious Prussian government the mere tool of the St. Petersburg cabinet an outlaw amongst nations, only incites them to consider whether the few victims who escape the double cordon around Paris are not to be given up to the hangmen of Versailles. That after the most tremendous war of modern times, the conquering and the conquered hosts should fraternize for the common massacre of the proletariat. This unparalleled event does indicate, not as Bismarck thinks, the final repression of a new society, upheaving, but the crumbling into dust of bourgeois society. The highest heroic effort of which old society is still capable is national war. And this is now proved to be a mere governmental humbug intended to, de to defer the struggle of classes and to be thrown aside as soon as that class struggle bursts out into civil war. Class rule is no longer able to disguise itself in a national uniform. The national governments are one as against the proletariat. After Whit Sunday, 1871, there can be neither peace nor truce possible between the working men of France and the appropriators of their produce. The iron hand of a mercenary soldiery may keep for a time both classes tied down in common oppression, but the battle must break out again and again in ever-growing dimensions, 
and there can be no doubt as to who will be the victor in the end, the appropriating few or the immense working majority. And the French working class is only the advanced guard of the modern proletariat. While the European governments thus testify before Paris to the international character of class rule, they cry down the International Working Men's Association, the, inter the international counter organization of labor against the cosmopolitan conspiracy of capital as the head fountain of all these disasters. Theorists denounced it as the despot of labor, pretending to be its liberator. Picard ordered that all communications between the French internationals and those abroad be cut off. Count Jobert, Thierse's mummified accomplice of 1835, declares it the great problem of all civilized governments to weed it out. The rurals roar against it. And the whole European press joins the chorus. An honorable French writer, Robinet, completely foreign to our association, speaks as follows. The members of the Central Committee of the National Guard, as well as the greater part of the members of the Commune, are the most active, intelligent, and energetic minds of the International Working Men's Association. Men who are thoroughly honest, sincere, intelligent, devoted, pure, and fanatical in the good sense of the word. The police-tinged bourgeois mind naturally figures to itself the International Working Men's Association as acting in the manner of a secret conspiracy its central body ordering from time to time explosions in different countries. Our association is, in fact, nothing but the international bond between the most advanced working men in the various countries of the civilized world. Wherever, in whatever shape and under whatever conditions the class struggle obtains any consistency, it is but natural that members of our association should stand in the foreground. The soil out of which it grows is modern society itself. It cannot be stamped out by any amount of carnage. To stamp it out, the governments would have to stamp out the despotism of capital over labor, the condition of their own parasitical existence. Working men's Paris with its commune will be forever celebrated as the glorious harbinger of a new society. Its martyrs are enshrined in the great heart of the working class. Is it its exterminators, history has already nailed to that eternal pillory from which all the prayers of their priests will not avail to redeem them.